Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Integrity Matters by Turnington. My name is Chooks, and today in the house, I've got Associate Professor of Supply Chain Management and Supply Chain Lead, Curtin Business School, Richard Oloren Toba. Um, today, we're going to be talking about upholding academic integrity and modeling integrity. Richard, would you be keen to um, um, introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about your background, your focus in terms of research and um, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis at Curtin University. Oh, thank you, um, Chukut. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yes, my background uh, is in supply chain management, as you have said. Um, I focus my research on humanitarian logistics, uh, humanitarian supply chains uh, for emergency response. So the management of crisis, uh, disaster response, emergency response, and issues of human security, human welfare. That's uh, the core area where I do my, my research. I also teach uh, supply chain management, uh, commercial supply chain management, uh, commercial logistics. Uh, so that's basically my background. I am relatively new to Curtin. I've only been here at Curtin for six months. Uh, but before that, I was at the University of Newcastle, as well as uh, QUT in Brisbane. Uh, that's just a short brief about my, my background. Excellent. Thanks for that really brief um, and very um, thorough uh, introduction. So we're going to start with um, um, discussing upholding academic integrity. And today we're looking at your key focus area, which is around modeling integrity. So my first question is, what is research integrity and why is this important, especially when you think about your background in supply chain? Yes, um, research integrity um, refers to issues of um, honesty, accuracy, when you are doing research. Uh, it um, entails things like validity, that the research you are conducting is actually valid, uh, the conclusions you reach actually address the research questions you've set out to address. It's also about issues of um, impact and the implications of your, of your research. Research integrity is just, uh, in summary, about how accurate your research is. Does your research actually throw more light on the subject you are researching? Does it answer the research questions accurately? Uh, there are many elements and dimensions to, to research integrity. Uh, basically, there are issues of how rigorous the research is, uh, how valid your instruments for collecting data is, for example, how honest is the research uh, and how honestly has it been undertaken? It's also about the issues of how transparent is it. Can outsiders actually follow your research step by step? How you designed it, how you collected data, how you analyzed data, how you interpreted the data, how you came to your results and conclusions. Uh, so it's also about uh, replicability. Can other researchers follow your exact steps and come to the same conclusions. These are some of the dimensions of research uh, integrity. There are other areas as well, such as fairness in the research, fairness to those who are participating in your research, those uh, providing you with data. Uh, also, it's about uh, issues of respect. If you are undertaking research that has to do with human participants, you have to show them respect. You have to give them accurate information, honest information about the research you are doing and uh, what you are going to to use the outcomes of, of such a research for. It's uh, also about accountability uh, in general and, and responsible conduct of research. This is what research integrity is. Excellent. Um, looking at why we know, uh, based on what you've um pointed out there in terms of fairness, um, validity, accuracy, and the honesty aspect of research. What would you say is Curtin's approach, or Curtin University's approach to research integrity? Do we, is there a methodology being followed? Is there a framework that's been rolled out? 
And what can you um, share with us in terms of how um, Curtin positions itself in, in the research integrity space? Yes, um, Curtin has a suite of policies that guides uh, researchers. So research integrity is uh, a major thing at Curtin. Uh, there are systems of policies, there are systems of training and professional development that all researchers and uh, higher degree research students must undertake. So um, research integrity is very robustly and first at Curtin University. Uh, there are many systems here for training. For example, you're not allowed to do any research until you have undertaken a research integrity module. So whether you are a student or you are an academic or a researcher, you must do a research integrity module and you must pass it uh, above 75% uh, for each of the modules. You must undertake, uh, for example, training in, in the use of copyright uh, in research, attribution uh, of other people's work. Uh, you must be aware and you must pass modules in export controls. For example, if you are in the scientific uh, areas of research, uh, you must know the law, uh, the policies uh, that uh, apply to, 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 to research integrity. Uh, also, you must undertake modules such as conflict of interest, uh, research design, and so on and so forth. So, Cotton is, is very much uh, advanced and it takes research in integrity very seriously so that each researcher know their responsibilities, they know their obligations. Also, Cotton as an institution knows its responsibilities under the law. Uh, for example, uh, researchers must provide uh, uh, guardianship and mentoring to, to trainees, to PhD students, to other research assistants, all the researchers that they supervise. They must be made aware of, of uh, the policies on research integrity, both within Curtin and nationally under the, the relevant uh, legislation guiding the conduct of research in Australia. So. The institution promotes research integrity through training and awareness. The researcher also has to promote uh, uh, research integrity within their own research, as well as make uh, researchers under them to be aware of the relevant uh, legislation. So compliance is big, training is big, record keeping uh, is big in terms of data, in terms of approvals, and so on and so forth. So these are all elements that Cotton has put in place to ensure that all legislation and all policies, institutional policies, are, are complied with uh, to start giving research integrity. Excellent. So it sounds like um, Curtin has got um, a big framework that supports the research integrity space as well as how people prepare for research. So knowing that every um, form of research would involve some risk, um, are you able to say, um, share with us some issues to research integrity that you are aware of or that you've um, experienced uh, as being part of the university sector? Yes, um, a common one uh, as a research supervisor myself, uh, supervising PhD students. One of the common ones is um, when PhD candidates innocently, and I must stress innocently, uh, forget to attribute uh, some of their work to the original uh, researchers who published the work or who undertook the work. Uh, it's an innocent oversight. Often it's um, uh, it emerges at the early stages of their candidature as PhD students um, when they are not aware that they need to, you know, for example, when you quote somebody, you must have to put in uh, the full citation as well as page numbers and use uh, uh, quotation marks. Uh, so many students uh, are not aware of this. Also, uh, some students uh, come from um, other um, national jurisdictions where 
the conduct of research there is a little bit different from Australia. So it takes them a while to understand the Australian approach to the responsible conduct of research. Mm. And so things like citations, you know, there are different uh, traditions to it. So uh, we get uh, some uh, international uh, research students who would need to be, you know, uh, educated on the Australian perspective. And, and so this is a common thing. Uh, but most students very quickly know the difference here and they are there by, by, the, by all the policies and laws uh, to do with referencing. Excellent. Um, with regards to knowing that um, it's very important for people to cite properly, use the right referencing, whether it's Harvard, AVA, um, APA, and all the others. Um, now, we know recently that we've pivoted into remote learning, and I would assume, or one would assume, that um, there would be a lot of challenges that have come with this pivot in terms of promoting and um, educating people within research integrity. What would you say, um, or how would you say um, Curtin University has helped in dealing with these challenges, including the issues you've also mentioned um, prior? Yes, um, this is a very big issue. And the question you ask is very topical. And when you talk about pivoting to uh, remote learning, I think there are two aspects to it. There's remote um, learning that undergraduate students undertake where we teach online and the students, uh, you know, they, we meet them on, on the Blackboard side or collaborate or another platform and we undertake online teaching and online learning. And there are issues that come with online assessments. So that's one. But uh, let me focus on the research uh, aspect. Uh, because of the pandemic, many uh, PhD students uh, and potential PhD candidates have, um, have been delayed because of travel restrictions uh, coming into Australia. So, for example, uh, we have candidates who are overseas and we have to be in communication uh, by, by phone or by Zoom. And so it makes it more challenging because... Traditionally, we have face-to-face -face contact with our PhD students. We see them on a weekly or fortnightly basis, and there are deep, you know, interactions uh, and exchanges. Uh, all this is more complicated when you have to look at uh, booking, uh, Zoom meetings, uh, time zones, and, and also not all information comes across well across, <laughs> across Zoom. Uh, and that intensity, just meeting somebody on the corridor, meeting your candidate on the corridor, they can quickly exchange a few words with you about the challenges they face. They can walk into your into your office and you can solve their problem right there with them. Uh, it's more complex, it's slower and more tedious when you have to book an appointment and wait, you know, two weeks. And then sometimes the connections are not good. Sometimes uh, there are delays. And, and, and so remote supervision um, is more challenging. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the, the big um, things we're hearing across the sector, especially the higher education sector, is how do we effectively support um, students as, um, when they're still back in their country and also look after the, um, the academic himself or herself while they are um, working with students. So thanks for sharing that. Um, now we're gonna move into the aspect of technology. We know that in the current climate, we are forced to um, use technology to somewhat keep the status quo in, in the education space. So what role does technology play in mitigating the risk to research, especially in the higher ed space? I think it will vary from discipline to discipline. Um, you know, if you are, say, you are a microbiologist, what uh, you will go through will be a little bit different from uh, my field, which is supply chain management. Uh, we are in management in the social sciences. Uh, but nevertheless, even before the pandemic, technology has always played a role. For example, in the area of record keeping, 
um, in the area of data management, uh, we keep we are required to keep uh, uh, primary data for a minimum of five years uh, in a secure location so that it can be accessed. So that can be done when you have you know uh, traditional files and paper, uh, other than locking those uh, you know interview transcripts up in a in a cupboard or in a wardrobe somewhere. Uh, but te with technology, just simple technology like uh, uh, the cloud, for example, that's one example where it helps us to pack a lot of data out. So you might have two or three different USB sticks on which your interviews are. I conduct face-to-face uh, -face interviews, sometimes telephone interviews. Mm -hmm. And so technology does help in, in, in that area of, of record keeping. Uh, even simple technologies like emails, uh, in, in order to get um, ethics approval before you start any program of research or any project of research, uh, you have to send emails. You know of all your 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 research instruments, your your consent forms, your uh, project information statements, and and all of that statements. Uh, in a Word file or a PDF file, and you send it to the ethics approval committee to look at your interview questions, for example, and then over a few, a few, a few days or weeks, uh, you, you get some approval back in an email. So that's another example of how technology uh, is helping in this area. Um, at the moment, uh, there are talk about. Um, more advanced technology like artificial intelligence uh, to be used in data crunching. So we can collect more data, uh, huge volumes of data. For example, in the area of big data in supply chain management, you know, you get uh, data from GPS that can track the trucks, data coming from RFID tags on goods, uh, and so many other sources of big data. And all this data can be uh, crunched using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, for decision support. So this is increasingly getting uh, more common uh, across uh, uh, global supply chains and with big, much bigger companies uh, that have the financial wherewithal to invest in such technologies. Excellent. I think you sort of moved into my next question, which is looking at um, the aspect of modeling integrity and how data from edtech, educational technologies, inform how institutions uh, improve research. Would you have any thoughts on how the data we get from um, the use of edtech in research integrity informs how uh, improvements are done across um, research integrity practices? Uh, for me personally, the, the key thing is, um, you know, there, I think there are two parts. Uh, let me put it this way. The first part is about the set of knowledge a researcher needs to know in order to comply with research integrity requirements. Uh, uh, the other one is also the behavioral aspects where uh, as a a senior researcher and supervisor, I have to be upfront in letting uh, my research team or, or my, my research candidates to know what the expectations are. And uh, I tell my uh, researchers, my PhDs, that uh, I focus on quality research and uh, I don't cut any corners, so I'm very explicit and uh, I let them know that all policies must be complied with and they must also attend all the courses and trainings uh, to do it with integrity. So uh, I'm very detailed when it comes to, to this and uh, I also tell them the importance of focusing on quality rather than quantity. Uh, particularly when it comes to, to research outputs. Uh, uh, some younger researchers in our field think it's just about quantity 
but I encourage them to do quality work. Uh, but quality work takes more time. It takes more effort. Uh, I know everybody's under time pressure. They want to get that publication out quickly. They want to get that PhD done quickly. Uh, but I tell them, uh, sometimes I sound like a, a, a conservative, uh, old-fashioned person, but <laughs> I'm very much risk averse. So I tell them, it will take time, but it's better to have a solid foundation of quality and build a reputation that will help your career on the long term. Uh, you do quality things, your research is transparent, it's replicable, and you keep all your data in case you are audited and so on and so forth. So I tell them all this. Uh, yeah. So I, I, that's the way I model research integrity. Integrity, yeah. I think I think that's very crucial. Um, one would um say the onus is on the university to create a culture that fosters that level of research integrity. But what are some strategies, institutions? Um, it sounds like Curtin does a, re a fair bit of really good work in terms of research integrity, but what are some strategies you could share with the wider educational um, community that would help in fostering a culture of research integrity? Well, um, I think we're already doing that at Curtin, but it's just to reinforce uh, the visibility, make research integrity more visible. Um, universities are generally very busy um, places and people are involved not just in research but in teaching, in administration, in engagement um, and, and various other tasks. So often um, research integrity seems to be just one out of you know a million things that universities do. So in order for us to reinforce um, um, to reinforce the, the, the paramount importance of research integrity, uh, I think you know uh, institutions globally can just make it far more visible where everywhere we see research integrity being you know profiled, we see you know for example, good examples being shown and being highlighted and being celebrated. Mm. Uh, and also, uh, what we shouldn't do should also be shown more explicitly in everyday life, particularly for early career researchers and PhDs, so that the culture is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is uh, cultivated right from the start, right from the outset. Mm. Uh, because some of this knowledge about um, research integrity and practice is, 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 is hidden. You don't know it unless you have been trained, unless you are an experienced researcher. It's not something you can pick up automatically. Uh, somebody has to tell you, somebody has to train you, somebody has to model it. So it's not, it's not learning by, by diffusion. It doesn't just happen. Uh, so I think more profile, more visibility, uh, we help it to have a much higher profile so it can saturate all across uh, any, any institution. But uh, as I said, Curtin is doing a lot here uh, in that regard. Integrity is big, whether it's in terms of teaching and assessment or whether it's in terms of, of research. Excellent. Thank you. So we're looking, and thanks for that response. I think um, you've actually shared more, um, a really important light, which is about the visibility of um, good practices. Um, but that's from a university um, point of view. Now, what would an academic, if I was an academic, um, let's say in supply chain, what would I be doing to model integrity for my students and how does that support their learning? And in becoming citizens of integrity, that's one of that's a terminology we use in Tenetin, which is creating um, or fostering a culture or um, creating citizens of integrity. Rather, my approach um, is that um, I don't look at integrity, research integrity, in a narrow sense. I don't look at it as a box ticking exercise uh, just for the sake of compliance. Mm. Um, I, I see integrity as a bigger thing. It's a lifelong thing. And it uh, percolates my whole life, not just my 
professional life as an academic and a researcher, but my whole life is all about integrity. And if you look at the definition of integrity, it's all about honesty, it's uh, being ethical, it's, it's being moral. Uh, and I think integrity is a well sought after trait. And so you show this in your day to day life. If you say there's going to be a meeting at six, then be there at six. Don't wait till six thirty or seven. Um, be a person who sticks to their word. Uh, be compassionate, be empathic, um, and uh, do your best to, to model that, that life of integrity in everything. Uh, and so research integrity in the context of research becomes just one part of a whole life and a whole career of, of uh, built on integrity. I think that's the, the best uh, way of looking at it is because it's not practicable to just isolate integrity in research why one doesn't practice in integrity in other parts of their life uh, I, I, I really like that last answer I think it's um, integrity starts with you and it translates into the various aspects of the being um, so my final question to wrap up this episode is looking at the aspect of educational technology and its role in um, um, ensuring integrity and assessment. So what role would you say um, from experience that educational technology, um, not just technology as a whole, um, plays in ensuring the integrity in, us, in research? First of all, I think Tonitin is very useful. <laughs> um, and uh, other similar software that checks for plagiarism, um, like Identicate, uh, you know, uh, I think it, it has a big role to play. Uh, Google, for example, just a simple search in Google can show whether a particular um, assessment task or a particular report <coughs> has been plagiarized, you know, whether it's been submitted as uh, an original work while it's not really original. So I use, I use um, Turnitin a lot. I use Identicate as well. I use Google. I check even things like uh, research proposals and you'll be surprised. I find a lot of research proposals are not original um, where students want to undertake PhD and they just uh, copy somewhere online and uh, I find that out. So I think I cannot overemphasize the, the role of um, educational technology in, uh, in detecting breaches of integrity. Uh, so let, let, let me put it that way. It's so important. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've just given examples of, of Turnitin uh, as, as a way to, to track uh, cases of uh, like Arizona and so forth. Did I answer all your questions? Yes, I think you did. Thank you so much. Um, there, there are several ways that question can be answered, and I think you really gave a practical example, which is basically the case of a research proposal, um, um, a student actually uh, putting in someone else's proposal. So I want, I'd like to say a big thank you for being part of today's episode. And um, we've come to the end of another episode of Turning Team by Integrity Matters um, with um, Richard Oloren Toba, Associate Professor of Supply Chain Management and Supply Chain Lead at Curtin University. Thank you again, and yeah, we we'll hope to continue um, collaborating with you. Thank you very much, Julie.